Chapter 10, the Meiji period, 1868 to 1912. As always, the chapter begins with an important crest of the period, and here we have the imperial family crest, or the Kiku Chrysanthemum crest. The Charter Oath of 1868, young samurai successfully leading the new government, bicycles, first trains, telegraphs, first people's army, adoption of the Meiji constitution, which is modeled after the German constitution, or Prussian constitution, the beginning of the great industrial cartels known as Zaibatsu, successful completion of war with China, the first Sino-Japanese war, followed by victory over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905, the expansion in literature, literary criticism, artistic criticism, aesthetics, and poetry. Japan emerges as a world power. The new Japan, and here in this image we see the scenes from the national history, Yamaoka Tetsutaro on a mission, and we see uh, Yamaoka Tetsu acting independently as a vassal of the shogun, riding from Edo to Shizuoka to meet the army of the emperor led by Saigo. He successfully proposed that the attack on Edo be postponed until a peace conference could be arranged. With the inauguration of the enlightened rule, or literally the translation of Meiji, which the emperor's progressive regime was then named, Japan emerged from the world of the past into the world of the present. The young emperor was a 15-year-old boy, but he was fortunate in having as advisors a group of men willing and able to shape the course of the new Japan. Working enthusiastically, they brought about a relatively smooth amalgamation of Eastern and Western cultures. Most of these ministers, many were quite young, came from the samurai class or the bushi class or the shizoka. All had been reared in the warrior tradition of responsibility and leadership. Some, who now pushed for the adoption of Western methods, had fought for the expulsion of the foreigners, the son no joi that we discussed earlier, in their effort to destroy the Tokugawa shogunate and restore the emperor while expelling the barbarians, as they put it. Now, realizing that Japan must play an international role in the world, they were united in looking towards the West. They hoped to adopt Western ideas while retaining the values of the East. As one of their spiritual predecessors, Sakuma Shouzang, wrote, Eastern aesthetics and Western science. This is an important slogan from the period. In Japanese, it's Toyo Dotoka Seiyo Gakuge. Throughout the new government, all efforts were directed toward improving the economy of the country and toward building up its military strength. So, economy and military strength. And the slogan uh, that is associated with this uh, sentiment is Fukoku Kyohei. Yet the emphasis on arming so that the country could negotiate on equal rather than unequal terms with the rest of the world and the Western powers was not done at the expense of the welfare of the whole country. The government respected the entrance of the merchants, the shonin, the form of feudal estate owners, which were known as daimyo, with the farmers, or the nomin, and the samurai, the bushi. The foreign experts in transportation, defense, agriculture, and industry were employed in their progressive methods carefully studied and adopted. Famously, there were many Yatoi Gaikokujin, they were known as, who were employed by the University of Tokyo, Tokyo Imperial University at the time, to introduce science and uh, culture and so forth to teach at the university, just for a, a decade or so. A pro program of social re reform was put into motion. Education was made compulsory, and by the end of the Meiji period, attendance in schools stood at 98%. On the left side here, we have Hodogaya on the Tokai Road, and in that image we see an early Meiji telegraph wires were strung on living trees from Tokyo to Kyoto. Beneath the wires is a roadside chaya, or tea house. And the image on the right here, we see famous places in Tokyo, the Mitsui House in Surugacho. And in that image, we see Japan's first commercial bank was this structure owned by the Mitsui family. It was located in the business center of Edo. And at the very top, we have Netsuke with an image of Christ. This is made of iron, brass, and silver. And in this Netsuke, we see secret Christian locket with Japanese characters on the face open to reveal the crucifix of the crucified Christ. Edicts banning Christianity, you will remember, were removed by the Meiji Emperor in 1873. As the young emperor grew older, he continued to rely on his ministers for advice. Yet in an unobtrusive manner, he exerted a moderating influence. Reared in Kyoto in seclusion, he was content to remain in the background. But through his dignity and wise counsel, he gave the throne a stature it had not known for hundreds of years. While the country embarked upon new ways, the imperial court emphasized traditional ethical values based on confusion Confucian philosophy deeply ingrained in the Japanese character. Inevitably, there were monumental difficulties to overcome in the changeover from feudalism to a central government, and there were minor rebellions and deep disagreements among the ministers, but none of these was allowed to disrupt the march of progress. The government of Japan, slowly at first, then with increasing speed, earned the respect of the world. All right, again, so keep in mind that this book was written in 1964, so some of its sort of uh, assumptions and pre 
presuppositions are a bit um, outdated, I think. But so we'll have to discuss that in class. On the next page, we have the Nihonbashi Tokyo, Tokai Nihonbashi Fuke. In that image, we see famous Tokyo Bridge. The Nihonbashi was the terminus, the end point of all highways leading into the city. Regulations and edicts were posted on wooden billboard structure at the left. Bicycles had recently been introduced into Japan as well, and there were said to be 50,000 jinriksha. And jinriksha uh, does not date back to antiquity. It was an invention of the late Edo period, you want to keep in mind. On the next page is the view of the railroad station with the train schedule, the Jokisha Shupatsu Jikoku Chinkinsuke. In that image, we see the first railroad running from Tokyo to Yokohama. Lettering at the top is the train schedule and the tri- ticket prices. The trip took approximately 53 minutes in this initial phase. Trains run on time. The miniature steam engine that had been presented to the Japanese government at the time of Admiral Perry's arrival in 1853 had made a deep impression. Even before the fall of the Tokugawa Bakufu or Shogunate steam engines had been ordered. The first train route was to be between Kyoto and Tokyo, but a series of unforeseen difficulties delayed the track lane between the old and new capitals, and Yokohama, which had become the most important trading center, became the terminus of the first railroad. Only four years after ascending the throne in 1868, the 19-year-old Meiji Emperor was able to make the first trip by train from Shinbashi Station to to in Tokyo to Yokohama. The trip at that time took 53 minutes, as I just mentioned. The inaugural run, however, was made in considerably less time. The British engineer was determined to show how much speed he could get from his engine. The train carrying the emperor and his entourage arrived in Yokohama before arrangements had been completed to receive them. Instead of congratulations upon his record-breaking trip, the engineer received a severe reprimand. Accounts of early train rides inevitably include anecdotes about passengers. Many observing the traditional ritual of removing one's shoes when entering a house left their shoes on the platform when they entered the train and regretfully watched them disappear as the strain departed. Other transportation kept pace. Horse-drawn carriages and streetcars, bicycles, and the recently invented jindiksa competed with hand-carried palanquins and ancient ox carts. Traffic was especially heavy in Tokyo on the street called Ginza, which became the first cobblestone thoroughfare. On the next page there, on the image on the left, we see 36 scenes of Tokyo, the islet of Echu of, of the Fukugawa Tokai Sanju Rokuge Fukugawa Echu Jima. And in that image, we see the first Japanese army was formed by Saigo. Soldiers adopted Western uniforms and learned to use European armaments. And on the right side, we see the Tomioka Raw Silk Reeling Factory, or Joshu Tomioka Seishijo no Zu. In that image, the early industrial building was Silk Reeling Factory. It's portrayed there. Workers were women. The building shows Western factory architecture. You can see the br- red bricks there. Industrial beginnings. The young Meiji government worked hard to balance production for domestic use as well as for export. Protection for native industries was a prime consideration, but the new internationalists understood the necessity for an accelerated industrial revolution in Japan. They were quick to adopt Western methods in heavy industries and in the processing of textiles. The foundations for some of the great fortunes of Japan were laid in the early Meiji period, when the government, after nationalizing and developing such industries as shipbuilding, mining, railroads, electricity, and silk and cotton mills, sold them to merchant contractors Actors, known as Seisho, who operated them as independent enterprises. This was the beginning of the Mitsubishi, the Mitsui, and the Sumitomo fortunes, and the birth of the great Zaibatsu organizations. The development of these corporations into powerful industrial combines was based upon tight family control, the general economic growth of the country, and the demand for consumer goods when a wave of prosperity came to Japan after the war with China. The war, while not entirely successful, opened new markets for Japan in Formosa, which is Taiwan, of course, and Mongolia. A few years later, the war with Russia, this is 1904 to 1905, which was a great success, brought additional markets. As these areas were open to Japanese goods, domestic markets increased. By 1905, Japan was able to compete successfully with Western goods in many Asian markets. At the top here, we see instructive stories of self-made men, portrait of Fukuchi Genichiro. And in that portrait is the famous correspondent Fukuchi Genichiro reporting about the Satsuma Rebellion, the recently formed government army fords the river. On the bottom, we have Fighting Women's Army of Kagoshima, or the Kagoshima no Onaguntai Rikizen no Zu. We see brave women from the island of Kyushu formed an army in order to fight against the government troops in the Satsuma Rebellion. Their weapons are traditional naginata, or long-handled swords, and were used against the government cavalry attack. 
Satsuma Rebellion. This involves the Satsuma and the Choshu clans. The first test of the young Meiji government came with the revolt of the powerful Satsuma clan, based in the southern region of the island of Kyushu. This influential clan was headed by the Shimazu family, which had been founded by the Shimazu Tadahisa, son of Minamoto Yoritomo, in the Kamakura period. It was one of the two powerful clans, the other was the Choshu, that made the restoration of power to the emperor possible. After nine years of working close to the central government, the samurai of Satsuma had grown dissatisfied with the direction of the government was taking. They organized a considerable army to fight against the untried troops of the central government. It was a momentous clash between traditional Japanese warfare as waged by the sword-wielding individual warriors and the new peasant army trained in Western strategy and using Western weapons. The rebellion was led by Saigo Takamori, a giant of a man with an engaging personality who just a few years earlier had been leader in the government and who, as field marshal, had actually been responsible for forming the government army that he now opposed. Saigo was one of the three young samurai who had joined the government and whose personal magnetism had helped to weld it together. The second was Kido Kouin, a samurai from the Choshu clan, who was an extraordinarily able diplomat, a master of the art of pers persuasion. Kido's historical importance rests primarily upon his conviction that feudalism had to be abolished if the nation was to prosper, together with his ability to convince the feudal lords or the daimyo that it was in their own interest as as well as their patriotic duty to return the emperor to power and to support the new central government. The third of the triumvirate was Okubo Toshimichi, who, as Saigo, was also a member of the Satsuma clan. Saigo was the impetuous man of action, Kido was the diplomat, and Okubo the master planner of the new regime. Later, it was because of the opposition of Okubo to Saigo's ideas for conquest and expansion that Saigo resigned from the government. Saigo had advanced a plan for the conquest of Korea that included sending an envoy to that country to make possible and insulting demands. This would result, he explained, in the Koreans ex executing the envoy and would thereby give Japan an excuse for declaring war. The envoy, he insisted, would be himself. Okubo and Kido refused him and Saigo went back to his home in Kyushu. There, he was prevailed upon to join the rebellious samurai and to lead them against the government army. And this large woodblock print at the top is the Harakiri of Saigo Takamori. Saigo Takamori Seppukuzu. In it, we see a mix-up in Telegram leading to the erroneous print of Saigo committing seppuku at sea. Actually, his suicide occurred on a mountaintop. The government acted swiftly to crush the rebellion. The fighting was brief but bloody. Saigo and his men fought well, but the government soldiers easily triumphed. When he was badly wounded, he committed suicide in the samurai tradition rather than be captured. But his contribution to the early government, his bravery and spirit were not forgotten. He became a hero to future Japanese soldiers and was pardoned posthumously by the Meiji Emperor whom he had both supported and opposed. All right, next page at the top there, we see a the first industrial fair in 1877. And depicted in that image, we see a daring Nishikie woodblock print uh, showing the faces of the Meiji Emperor and Empress as they attend first trade fair. The first industrial fair. The new Japanese Navy band, resplendent in Western uniforms, played at the inaugural ceremony of Japan's first industrial fair. The emperor and empress arrived in their royal coaches to open the exposition. The year was 1877, the tenth year of the reign of the Meiji Emperor. The fair was located at Ueno, notable as the site of the Kang Enji Buddhist Temple. Illustrated the remarkable progress made in the nine years since the reformation of the central government. The Japanese government had participated in the international fairs of Vienna in 1873 and of Philadelphia in 1876 and had felt the need of a trade show of their own. The emphasis was on industry for the promoters of the fair hoped to show that Japan's craftsmen and industrial designers could produce western type goods as well as traditional Japanese items. The fair lasted for 102 days and was a great success. Six more such industrial expositions were held during the Meiji period. Okay, on the next two pages we have the reception of the ex-president President Ulysses S. Grant at Ueno. Ueno ko enchi ni oite granto kun kyo o no zu. In this woodblock print, we see the ex president of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, visiting Japan in 1879. He was entertained royally at an elaborate affair given in his honor. Seated at the left of the general and his wife are the emperor and empress of Japan. 
On the left here, we see the ladies with Western musical instruments. And in that woodblock print, we see Japanese ladies who are taking naturally to Western fashions that had become very popular in Tokyo in the 80s and the 90s. And at the bottom on the right page there, we have the ladies sewing, the Kijo Saiho no Zu. There we see the making of Western style dresses had become an early home industry in the Meiji period. Sewing machines were a vital import. Dancing and diplomacy. Up until the late Meiji period, party dresses were not a social problem for the Japanese woman. She wore her seasonal kimono and by tradition rarely attended parties, certainly never parties where foreign gentlemen and their ladies were likely to be present, but Foreign Minister Inoue Kaoru attempted to change this with a policy of entertaining foreigners in Western style. His elaborate plan called for the construction of a special building which was called the Dokumeikang, and this is probably the most important building along with the uh, tower that we'll get into later, of the Meiji period so Nicole will want to flash an image of the Dokumeikan here. Inoue's idea of entertaining foreign guests in their own fashion was not strictly for social reasons. He, along with other Japanese ministers, believed that foreign dignitaries and members of legations would be more likely to accept revisions to inequitable trade agreements made by Japan when the country was opened. These treaties, signed at the time when Japan was in no position to bargain, were decidedly favorable to the foreign countries and a source of continuous irritation. And so so it was that a small number of Japanese women got their first Western party dresses. With the importation of the sewing machine, the number of Western dresses available increased rapidly and a whole new dressmaking or yosai industry was formed. The elaborate parties had no effect upon treaty revision, of course. This fact, added to the expense and disregard of established convention, brought this style of diplomacy into disrepute and ultimately caused the resignation of Foreign Minister Inoue. The new Foreign Minister, Okuma, believed that dancing and fancy dress balls were the province of businessmen, not of the Japanese government. The first constitution. Here at the bottom of the page is the first meeting of parliament, the Nihon Teikoku Kokusai Kari Giji Doze. In that image, we see the first session of the parliament meeting with the emperor, who is pictured there top center. Many famous Japanese statesmen can be identified. And in class, we'll go over this and see how many we can identify. And at the top here on the right is the ceremony of the parliament of the imperial constitution, Kempo Hapu Seiriki no Zu. In that image, we see a great event in Japanese history occurred in 1889 when the Emperor Meiji presented the first imperial constitution. Japan's first constitution was not an imitation of any foreign charter, although it was modeled after the, Jer the Prussian constitution. We can look at, into the details about that in class. Unlike Western constitutions, its base rested on the principle of a divine emperor, an absolute ruler and deity whose sovereignty was unquestioned. But it did provide for a parliament, the Diet, consisting of two houses, the nobles, and in theory, the commoners. The father of the Japanese constitution was Ito Hirobumi, who had been appointed by the emperor in 1881 to draft it. His knowledge of Western government began when he defied the edict of the Tokugawa government and sailed to Europe while the country was still technically under Sakoku or uh, closed country law. Later trips were made as a government envoy. Ito Hirobumi worked on his draft of the constitution for a total of eight years. Feeling that it should be shaped to the traditions of the country, he was in no hurry to adopt an unworkable system. When finally presented in 1889, the constitution represented an unlimited monarchy for all ministers of state as well as heads of the army and navy reported directly to the emperor rather than to the diet representatives. Limited though it was, Ito's constitution was the beginning of representative government in Japan based on law, and it added measurably to Japan's growing prestige in the world. At the top of the page, we see a woodblock print titled March to Attack Way Highway, and in Japanese the title is Ikai e Kogeki Hyojo no Shingun. And in that woodblock print, we see um, after a successful campaign, campaign in Manchuria, the Japanese Japanese invade the North China Peninsula. The army landed from boats embedded in ice, which is portrayed there. And at the bottom, we see Sergeant Kawasaki crossing the Taitang River Kawasaki Gingo Watada. to observe the enemy movements. The Sino Japanese war hero named Sergeant Kawasaki swims a wide river in central Korea, carrying a sword in his mouth. The war with China, and again, the years for this are 1894 to 95. This is the first Sino Japanese 
War, the war between China and Japan had its beginnings in Korea. China claimed suzerainty over the peninsula, but Japan enjoyed favorable trade relations with Korea and resented China's growing influence. A revolt in Korea, followed by the movement of Chinese troops going to the aid of the Korean king, provided Japan with a sought-after opportunity to intervene and to demand that China evacuate the peninsula. In July 1894, the Japanese began the war by sinking a Chinese troop ship and during the next nine months proceeded to force the Chinese army out of Korea. The victorious and well-organized Japanese then proceeded to take the Liaotung Peninsula and to capture the North China harbor of Port Arthur during the following eight months. The war was over in less than a year. In April 1895, China ceded Formosa, Taiwan, the Pescadores Islands, Port Arthur, and the Liaotung Peninsula at the southern tip of Manchuria and recognized the complete independence of Korea. But Japan was not to be allowed the fruits of victory. The powerful Western countries of France, Russia, and Germany exerted immediate pressure, forcing her to give up the Liaotong Peninsula, as well as the harbor and fortress of Port Arthur. Left without a choice, for Japan was in no position to oppose these powers, the Meiji Emperor accepted the demands on behalf of the embittered country. There was much righteous anger during the ensuing years directed against these Western nations, for each of them seized, leased, or annexed Chinese territories to themselves. France moved into Guangzhou in South China. The Germans took control of Tsingtao and Kiaochao, while Russia occupied Port Arthur and the Liaotong Peninsula. This Russian move was to become one of the causes of the Russo-Japanese War. At the top here, we see fighting in the snow. The greatest land battle of Russo-Japanese War was fought in Manchuria near the city of Mukden. The armies clashed in winter. And on the right side at the bottom, we see the reporting on the capture of Port Arthur. In that, we see kites were flown as the signal of the surrender of Russians at Port Arthur. The harbor had been under siege for 154 days. And the image at the top, we see the Japanese Navy destroyed a larger Russian fleet in the the Battle of the Japan Sea. This engagement hastened the end of the war. The war with Russia. Again, Korea served as a stepping stone to war. Russian influence was growing fast in that country, and combined with Russian control of Port Arthur and the Liaotong Peninsula, Japan's trading areas were severely threatened. An alliance with Great Britain supplied Japan with the security she needed to attack the expanding Russian outposts. When the Russians demanded a neutral zone in Korea to begin north of the 39th parallel and insisted upon complete control of trade and resources in South Manchuria, Japan responded by discontinuing diplomatic procedures. Moving her navy into the coastal area without warning, she attacked a portion of the Russian fleet at Port Arthur. Japan declared war the next day. The war was short, dramatic, and conclusive. Because Russia was much larger and was considered a far more powerful country than Japan, world opinion considered the Japanese the underdog, and most of the world sided with her. The Japanese army fought courageously, even brilliantly, winning one campaign after another against the dogged Russian army. In the United States, President Theodore Roosevelt did not hesitate to express his admiration for the courage of the Japanese. The war was over in 18 months. Fast running out of both trained soldiers and money, Japan suggested to the U.S. president that a peaceful settlement of the conflict be proposed. Treaty was signed at Portsmouth, New Hampshire. While Russia was defeated, Japan in turn was economically exhausted. The new face of Tokyo. On the left side of the page there, we see the picture of the Ryoonkaku the skyscraper. Ryoonkaku Tordan Sugodoka. Picture of the Dio Unkaku, which famously uh, was destroyed in 1923. This was the first skyscraper in Japan. It had 12 stories. It was an amusement center in downtown Tokyo in the Asakusa region. It had, in the uh, Stamachi Asakusa region, it had Japan's first elevator. And on the right side, we see Night Fair at the 5th Industrial Trade Fair at Ueno Park. In that lithograph, we see electric lights blaze across the entrance to the 5th Industrial Fair. Japanese and Western style clothing was worn by its attendants. The face of urban Japan changed rapidly at the turn of the century. Most new construction and modernization was confined to the cities, where Western and traditional architecture were combined to produce unique landmarks. Most interesting among these landmarks was the Ryo Unkaku, rising over the clouds, literally is the translation, uh, Tokyo's first skyscraper. This slim, round edifice did indeed seem to reach to the heavens. There were 12 stories, which included three observation towers above the 8th floor, and a copula on the top rising 220 feet above the ground. The first elevator to be seen in Japan was installed and operated up to the 8th floor. Ju Nikai, 12 stories, as the tower was affectionately called, immediately became the most popular amu amusement center in Japan. It was dedicated from basement to top to pleasure. There were theaters, bars, and restaurants on every floor. So popular was the building that thousands of woodblock prints were made for a game called Sugoroka. 
a popular pastime played by both adults and children. The player progressed upward or downward from one landing to another depending upon the throw of the dice. The area in which Junikai was located had long been one of Tokyo's amusement sections, but with the construction of the, this building, the district known as Asakusa became the most important entertainment region of the city. Other areas of Tokyo were modernized with ugly square brick shops replacing the earlier wood and shoji structures. Typical of this change was that of the Ginza, which became the main shopping center. Modern western style buildings began to replace earlier structures throughout the central business district called Marunouchi, which developed almost in the shadow of the imperial palace. But a strong and successful effort was made to retain as much of the natural beauty as possible and it was reflected in forested groves, parks, and temple grounds. Architectural borrowing from the west stopped in the urban areas. In towns and villages and throughout the countryside, Japanese architecture continued to develop along traditional lines. All right, at the top left corner of the next page, we see the night scene in Yoshiwara. And there we see the Westerners and Japanese stroll in the moonlight, viewing the spring cherry blossoms in the Yoshiwara district of Tokyo. At the bottom, we see the funeral procession of the Emperor Meiji. And in the triptychs, we see dignitaries from throughout the world attend the funeral of the Emperor Meiji. In his reign, Japan progressed from an isolated nation to an internationally respected world power. And at the top right, we see a concert using Japanese and Western instruments. Wayo Gasso is the Japanese title. Toward the future. Even before the death of the Meiji Emperor, Japan had become an important power in the modern world. Not all its gains had been made through warfare, although its victorious campaigns in China and Russia had shown other nations that Japan could defend itself and was even capable of extending its power. Clearly, the most significant advances in the late Meiji period were in industry and education. One of the earliest steps of the first representational government was to form a Ministry of Education. Formed in 1872 under the rescript on education, the Mumbu Karaksho, it's called in Japanese. The first imperial decree for the encouragement of education came in 1872, as I just mentioned, and by 1912, when the greatly respected Meiji Emperor died, most of its provisions had become fact. The decree read in part, There shall hereafter be no illiterate family among the people of any community, nor shall there be any illiterate member in any family. Learning is the basis for all human endeavor, from the commonplace speaking, reading, writing, and calculating for everyday needs to the professional needs of the military man, government official, farmer, merchant, craftsman, and artist in the multitude of technical skills in arts and in law, politics, and astronomy. One sentence in the rescript on education is issued by the Meiji Emperor himself, which reads, Devote yourself to public service in a national emergency. And this helped to unify the Japanese people during the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War. The first state educational institute the University of Tokyo, which was then called the Imperial University of Tokyo, or Tokyo Teikoku Daigaku, was founded in 1877, and within 30 years, four other universities were opened. Japanese architecture was beginning to influence the architecture of the modern world, and Japanese painting was having a distinct influence on the evolution of the French Impressionist school. Japanese industry occupied a solid and respectable position in the world market. The country, which had been an isolated and feudal state just 60 years before, had become one of the great powers of the modern world. And this final image and the last page of this book is the Hoshi Omiru Jose, Women Looking at the Stars. Okay, that concludes chapter 10 of this book, Japan, A History and Art. I will see you all in class and we will go over the details of chapter 10 and do a review of the entire span of Japanese history over the next few days. Goodbye.